The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the authors and participants and do not necessarily represent those of Storic Media or their employees. This series contains discussions with themes of violence and sexual violence. Listener discretion is advised. After a prolonged period of investigating this story, it became difficult for me not to be invested and connected to the many people assisting me with the case. At the end of the day, we were all bonded by the same mission, to find justice for these women. I began speaking regularly with Reverend Hood, who was intimately involved in the case of the 51. He began opening up to me about how police working these cases use disrespectful language towards marginalized victims. The same victims they are supposed to be protecting and serving. There's an abbreviation they use, not just in Chicago, in this country called NHI. And that stands for non-human involvement. When they find a woman dead. Non-human involvement, NHI. At one time, it was used in California to label when they found women dead that was believed to be prostitutes or drug addicts. We've heard it mentioned here in Chicago over the years. So that's enough to anger you. You know, that means your daughter, your mother, your wife, your your, uh, sisters, they're all in trouble because if they get up and go to work and got to be at work at seven o'clock in the morning and it's still dark and they get killed in their garage, they, they, they label them as a high risk. Well, there was a woman getting ready to go to work that teach at a school down the street. So it's incredible that the way not only Chicago, but this country look at particularly black and brown women when they get murdered. This was the first time I had heard the term NHI, or non-human involvement, which I discovered was a slang term conceived in the 1980s by the Los Angeles Police Department to signify the murders of sex workers and drug users. When you set aside the various details in this complex cold case, you are left with only one reality, that there were at least 51 women who were murdered their lives and futures ripped away from them. For me, that was the only fact that mattered. And although there were various theories around the 51, there was a real lull of momentum in the case until finally a confession tape surfaced that would point us in a new, terrifying direction. Whatever was going on with her, she was not going to go down without a fight. 50 women match the same death she died. Those are the three uh, killing fields. Crime researcher says there's a pattern that could point to a serial killer. For many years, our algorithm has been signaling red alert. There was a DNA match. Why didn't the state's attorney extradite this man? We loved her very much. I had started my investigation with a broad overview of this complex cold case, and in the process, began narrowing my scope to individual cases and clues, hoping to find the minutia that would lead me to a breakthrough. In doing so, I kept circling back to one detail in this cold case that seemed significant, where these victims were found. I remembered a very specific comment Thomas Hargrove made about a case in Washington Park that had caught my attention. That's the eerie commonality with almost all of these murders. Uh, The victims were found in uh, empty alleyways, abandoned buildings, uh, vacant lots, and trash cans. In uh, several of these cases, uh, the trash cans were set on fire. Um, In uh, one case, there was uh, two women in 2007 who were murdered on opposite corners of Washington Park. Uh, They were uh, killed 24 hours apart. Uh, They were both put into trash receptacles and those trash cans were set on fire. Um, And 
frankly, uh, I can't imagine anything that uh, that more eloquently speaks to serial murder than that. November 13th, 2007. It was a cold, unremarkable winter day when police officers noticed a fire in the southwest entrance of Washington Park. But this wasn't your ordinary fire. Upon further inspection of the scene, a body was discovered inside a garbage can. It was charred beyond recognition. The victim was 21-year-old Teresa Bunn. According to the medical examiner's report, Bunn had sustained multiple fractures throughout her body, indicating a brutal struggle for her life. The official cause of death? Strangulation. I paused when I got to a certain point in the report and my heart dropped. Bunn wasn't the only victim in this homicide. Subsequent investigation revealed she was pregnant in her third trimester. Her unborn baby was our youngest victim. A mother's love runs deeper than any type of love on the planet, which made me know in my heart that Bun wasn't just fighting for her life and future, but for that of her child. Heavily pregnant and showing, I realized whoever viciously strangled Bun and set her on fire was very aware that they were taking two innocent lives that day. A next level type of evil. As if Bun's case weren't heartbreaking enough, this story was turning out to be even more unbelievable. On November 14th, 2007, the day after Bun's murder, another victim was discovered on the opposite end of Washington Park from where Bun was found. Just like in Bun's case, police officers spotted a fire and upon approaching the scene, saw a plastic garbage can burning. Inside the melted garbage can was the body of 52-year-old Hazel Marie Lewis. Both Bun and Lewis had been strangled, dumped in a garbage can, and set on fire in Washington Park within 24 hours of each other. The victim, Hazel Marie Lewis, was a beloved mother and grandmother. Her family told police that Lewis spent one of her last nights alive taking her granddaughter to a pumpkin patch before she was brutally murdered and set on fire. Upon further investigation of these cases, even more eerie similarities became clear. There was no sexual component in either Bunn or Lewis's case, and no DNA recovered from either crime scene, leaving very little forensic evidence for investigators to work off of. Which made me speculate that dumping a body in a garbage can and setting it on fire could possibly mean one of two things. A manner for someone to easily destroy evidence, or a potential calling card of a serial killer. While there was little forensic evidence to go off of in either case, I thought about the environment of the crime and the fact that they were discovered in a public park. Based on the victim's case files, it wasn't clear whether these women were strangled outside of Washington Park and then later dumped there, or whether the actual crime and disposal occurred inside of the park. Either way, I needed to speak with someone from the Chicago Police Department to learn more about witness accounts. I reached out to multiple people inside the Chicago Police Department currently investigating this cold case, and to this day, no one has responded to my inquiries. Undeterred, I found someone who was willing to speak with me a former Chicago police officer and homicide detective. My name is uh, Gerald Hamilton. I'm a uh, former police officer and homicide detective. Uh, 
Did about 30 years in law enforcement, a couple years out in the suburbs south of Chicago, Illinois, and then with Chicago Police Department. I worked uh, a lot of specialized units, gang, tactical, uh, things like that. And then I was promoted to homicide detective in 1998 and the work to the bulk of my latter career as a homicide detective. With his storied background, Hamilton has seen it all, especially when it comes to the task of getting witnesses to come forward in these types of violent crimes. A big part of being a homicide detective is the ability to get witnesses to come forward, something Hamilton is very familiar with. I mean, it's a lot harder to, to catch witnesses than it is to catch offenders. And and, and that, that being to be said, um, we, we can a lot of times knowing and showing is obviously two different things. We know, you know, Tootie Jack did this and everybody in the neighborhood knows it as well. But obviously, for our purposes, we need everybody in the neighborhood, or at least a couple people in the neighborhood to come in and actually be willing to be documented, you know. So there's a disconnect with that, you know, unfortunately, in a lot of neighborhoods in this this neighborhood, particularly uh, black and brown neighborhoods and stuff. There's a historic um, disconnect because there's been a lot of uh, abuses and uh, marginalization by the police departments and stuff. And again, I'm not just talking about Chicago, you know, I mean, you, you'll find this bears out, but it's not just the black and brown community. I mean, I dare say if you go to um, Little Italy up up on here in Chicago and it, somebody get their ass beat out there, a lot of times there's, you know, nobody's talking about when the police roll up, nobody's coming out, oh yeah, so-and-so did that. Part of the problem is the disconnect. If you're sitting in an ivory tower or say, you know, detective division headquarters or something like that, it's great. I mean, you can roll up with the lights and the sirens and, you know, you can put the yellow tape around and you can go through through all of that. And uh, at some point in time, you know, you're kind of just going through the through the motions of, of doing these things. That, that tend to, you know, morph themselves into why a lot of crimes don't get solved and stuff. And then, like you said, you know, the flip side of that coin is, uh, you know, how bad do you want the crime solved? Hamilton also shared with me his unique insight into the mysterious crime patterns of the 51 and how vastly strangulations differ compared to other types of violent crimes in Chicago. You have to factor all this in, and this just unfortunately comes back to play when you when you talk about the length of time. This horrendous, you know, pattern of crime when you have similarities. There's a lot of people get murdered in Chicago, unfortunately. We've had that title, the murder capital of the world. You know, the politicians mm-hmm. don't like it, but it is what it is. But when you have people like strangled and thrown in dumpsters and stuff, that's not that's not the Chicago way. I mean, you know, I mean, we just shoot you, you know. I mean, so those those things kind of stick out as as a uh, an outliers. And yeah, well, you know, they had eight hundred homicides. Wait a minute, but we had fifty one of them that were strangulations of women and some of similar demographics and in similar, you know, area. Wait a minute, you know, that's something that you should be, you know, as we say, a crime pattern that should be jumping out at you. I mean, um, that can't just blend in with the with the, with the, the drive by shootings and everything. It's it's a unique personal type of crime. I was unable to verify if there were witness reports in either Bunn or Lewis's case. But what I was able to gather was that when it came to our large cluster, these women weren't the only victims that had been dumped in trash cans. Out of the 51 women, seven were dumped in trash cans over a 14-year period. Teresa Bunn and Hazel Marie Lewis were the only women set on fire. Diving into Hargrove's algorithm, the first known victim to have been strangled and subsequently dumped in a trash can was Latanya Keeler in August of 2003. The last known victim was 34-year-old Rio Rene Holyfield, who was discovered in the garbage by a sanitation worker in September of 2018. Then there was 21-year-old Diamond Turner, who 
whose lifeless body was dumped in a trash can in March of 2017. Diamond Turner's case marked an important moment in the investigation for me. With a case this large and a trail of different clues to follow, I felt overwhelmed and frustrated that there were so many suspects and leads, but nothing that pointed to a definitive perpetrator. Then, in January of 2020, Diamond Turner's case took a turn when her boyfriend, Arthur Hilliard, was arrested for her murder. This moment was pivotal as it marked the first arrest in the case of the 51. A few months after his arrest, the Chicago Police Department announced that Hilliard is also suspected in two other murders, but they are not believed to be connected to the 51. The relief of Hilliard's conviction was short-lived, and while his arrest was a step forward in the case, it also illuminated a startling reality a shockingly low clearance rate of 1.9%. This number translates to one out of 51 murders being solved over a 20-year time span. I would be lying if I didn't say that this statistic depressed me. But I knew my only respite was to press forward and put my attention back on the Washington Park murders. To date, both Teresa Bunn and Hazel Marie Lewis's cases remain unsolved. But with so many eerie similarities, it felt like they had to be connected. I reached back out to Hargrove to see if he had any theories. I I don't want to name names, but police think they know who one of the killers was for one of the women. They suspect a former boyfriend. Uh, That having been said, they could be right, they could be wrong. The um, the, uh, state's attorney's office refused to take the case to trial because... Uh, They thought the um, evidence was insufficient. Um, It was a case in which um, most of the evidence against the boyfriend involved the actions that he took to try to avoid arrest, Uh, actions that he could have taken whether he was guilty or innocent of the murders. He he did go to um, uh, pretty extensive uh, steps to try to get people to uh, provide testimony that it wasn't him. Um, That isn't proof that he did it. It is proof that he was trying to influence uh, the investigation. Um, The state's attorney's office um, declined to prosecute. The Chicago Police Department considered that case cleared. The, the, The challenge, though, is if If you think it was a boyfriend in one case, what do you do with an identical case in which the boyfriend is not connected that occurred within 24 hours? Um, And again, cases that are eerily similar, I mean, really similar and uh, so uh, geographically connected, apparently. Um, if, if the Chicago Police Department really thinks they know who one of the, one of the uh, offenders was, um, then they would have to conclude that it was a coincidence. And a coincidence in those two killings just doesn't seem very likely. And there's no reason to think that the boyfriend decided to try to make it look like a, a, a serial killer, because in 2007, there was no discussion whatsoever of serial murder in Chicago. There was no buzz about that. Um, no, I either the, either they're right and they just got unlucky, or they're wrong, and these are connected cases, and um, they are within both of them are within walking distance of the Chicago Green Line, although one is on the other side of Washington Park. But um, I, you ask me, everyone's got an opinion. You ask me, these are connected murders. And I don't, I, I'm not sure I would buy the, the, the boyfriend theory. I pulled up a map of Washington Park for context. Immediately, I noticed the Chicago Transit Authority's green line running adjacent to the park, which made me think of something Hargrove had mentioned. Um, we do think that uh, it's quite likely that uh, one of the killers was availing himself of uh, public transit. Uh, The uh, the pattern along the green line is really quite 
quite interesting and almost certainly um, is not a coincidence. I pressed him further for more information on this potential killer and the cluster he mentioned around the Green Line. We think there are at least three killers involved in this cluster. Uh, We think it's very possible that Darren Vaughn is one of them. Uh, we, um, we have been urging police for uh, a while now uh, to try to interview him. They have. The Chicago Police Department has tried to get Mr. Vaughn to elocute to the crimes he said he committed in Illinois. Um, he said uh, when he was talking uh, to Hammond police detectives that there were way more uh, uh, victims in Illinois than there were in uh, in uh, Indiana, in the Gary area. He um, also said that when he would get a killing urge on him, he would want to get away from his family because he didn't want to hurt them. So he would ride the bus, ride the train uh, to get away from uh, his family. And uh, we certainly take interest in uh, a, a convicted serial killer who says he would take public transit uh, to get away and to, to uh, find victims uh, outside of Gary, Indiana. Um, we go back to that cluster along the uh, CTA Green Line in South Chicago. Um, I think it's quite possible that when uh, Mr. Vaughn said that he killed way more people in Illinois, that he was speaking the truth. Darren Dion Van one of Indiana's most prolific serial killers, was serving life in jail for sexually assaulting and strangling seven women to death in Gary, Indiana. Van's name had stayed out of the news until the summer of 2021, when a confession tape was unearthed. In the recording, Van confesses to Hammond police detectives to not only strangling the seven women in Gary, Indiana, but alluded to killing, quote, way more victims in Illinois. I I, I guess what I'm asking, uh, how does the rage, how do you connect the rage with these people that... They're they're random. They're random. All it does is take the wrong person to say something or it triggers something from my past. That's why I really can't give you Illinois because Illinois probably has a whole lot of... They have more than Indiana, looks like that. They have way more than Indiana. This was the moment we had been waiting for. It was time for me to track down Darren Dion Van. 